Let's talk about the thermodynamics of salts dissolving in water. You may recall that we talked about the solubility rule chart in order to determine the physical state of the various reagents and products that you were dealing with when balancing chemical equations. And to some you know, reasonable extent, this table does a relatively good job of predicting whether a substance will remain soluble or insoluble in solution. But there is a much more robust way to get at it. Now granted, it's still an approximation, but it is a much more robust way to you know, go in about it. And this uses another definition that you will have to utilize to basically arrive at the conclusion of whether the salt will dissolve in water or not. And this has to do with the salt, the moment you add it to water, if it does dissolve, what we're saying is that the cation splits apart and now it's AQ, meaning that it's surrounded by water, and then the anion is also split apart and it's AQ. And as long as you keep the proportions you know, equal, in other words, the equation balance, you're gonna be okay. So if you had two nitrates, then you put two nitrates here. If you had three potassiums, you will put three potassiums. The fact that we only have one of each means that we only have one of each on the product side. But this is the enthalpy of reaction that we're gonna to try to evaluate and approximate. And the idea is that if the salt is to dissolve by itself in water, the energy of the products should be lower than the energy of the reactants. So what we expect for this value is to be a negative value for delta H of reaction. On the other hand, if the value of delta H is positive, what that would tell us is that the products are higher in energy than the reactants, and most likely than not, the salt will remain insoluble. All right, now, the way we approximate this particular equation is by using other definitions that we've used in the past, specifically for the salt. Notice that we have the salt in the solid form and we have the cation and anion components. That may remind you of a similar premise in which we have the salt, the solid salt, and the gaseous ions, specifically the lattice enthalpy. But notice here that we're going from the salt to the gaseous ions. So in fact, this particular equation drawn on the left side is the negative of the lattice enthalpy. And then pretty much what we do is we hydrate each one of the ions individually. I can start with potassium plus gas. If you add water to it to make it AQ, uh, you can actually get the hydration enthalpy. Oh, but yes, one thing I need to remind you is that the lattice enthalpy we can approximate using the Kapitinsky equation here that we utilized in the previous lecture. So we have a means of going directly for the lattice enthalpy just by um, inputting some values into this equation. But as I was saying, the potassium plus gas can be uh, hydrated, in which case you now form potassium plus AQ. And the process of going from gas to AQ is what we call the enthalpy of hydration. And this is specifically the enthalpy of hydration of the cation. If you had more than one potassium, so if you had two potassiums, for instance, the delta H of hydration of the cation would be multiplied by two. If you had three halves potassium, you'll have to multiply this by three halves. After this, we complete the process by hydrating the anion. The anion goes from gas to AQ. We call that the delta H of hydration of the anion. And once again, if you had more than one anion, you have to multiply the delta H of hydration by whatever that balancing coefficient is. But what you're seeing right here is that minus delta H lattice plus delta H hydration of cation plus delta H hydration of anion equals the delta H of the reaction. And um, with this tiny approximation, we can calculate the enthalpy of reaction of the solution of the salt. Now, the enthalpies of hydration themselves do have some approximations that we can use. And specifically, the enthalpy of hydration of the cation can be approximated using the following formula, negative 609 charge square divided by the ionic radius of the cation plus 0.5. This particular equation does a relatively good job of approximating the delta H of hydration of cations. And for anions, you have a relatively similar formula and simple formula, 
negative 570 charge squared divided by the radius of the anion. That approximates the delta H of the delta H of hydration of the anion relatively well. And as I've already pointed out, the lattice enthalpy has the Kapotinsky equation, which we use as an approximation for this. And notice that what you do need in order to solve these equations ultimately are the ionic radii of the cation and the anion along with the charges. If you know that, you basically can get all three of these values. Uh, just as a reminder, all of the radii have to be in angstroms. So if not given in angstroms, you're going to have to convert each one of them to angstroms before you use the equations. And as long as everything is in angstroms, all of the delta H values calculated here will be in kilojoules per mole. All right, uh, and yes, ionic radii are going to be the, the thing that you look for and that you utilize to solve this type of equations. So, um, is, you know, you're going to either use the values there, most likely not, I will provide them for you, but I also want to make you aware that there is approximated ionic radii values for polyatomic anions like hydroxide, nitrate, hydrogen sulfide, perchlorate, sulfate, they have approximated values. So we might actually use some of those to calculate whether a salt will dissolve or not. And so this will give us a nice way of predicting whether salts can be soluble or not. And in some degrees, extend the repertoire of what you know salts we can actually look into to determine solubility. All right, so just remember, if the final value of the reaction is less than zero, meaning that it's negative, the dissolution of the salt in water is favorable. It probably will dissolve. But if it is positive, there is a chance that the salt will remain a precipitate and won't actually dissolve in water, at least not to an appreciable extent. Okay. Now uh, we're going to continue on the next video talking about concentrations, so I'll see you in the next video.